Get your Bibles out with me, if you don't mind, and just remain standing in Guthrie. And if you've sat down in Guthrie, just stand right up and let's go into God's Word, the book of Matthew, chapter number 24. Matthew, chapter number 24. Just stand with me and let's read just three verses. I would like for you to keep your Bibles open, though, because I want to go back to several more verses as we are kicking off a new series today called What Comes Next? What's next on the horizon? What next is going to happen? What craziness is going to befall us? Matthew chapter number 24, starting with verse number one, it says, as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. What's going on here? They, the disciples just stop and say, look at these buildings. What was behind that statement? It was the awesomeness of those buildings. Historians would say that it was probably the most incredible feat on the face of the planet at the time. The beauty of these buildings, being the temple, was quite magnificent, quite amazing. But what we find out from Jesus is that he is not so concerned about the outward appearance as we are. Look at verse number two. But he, Jesus, responded, do you see all of these buildings? I'll tell you the truth. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Exclamation point there. Jesus is driving home something to get their attention. One, to get off the outward and onto the inward. Matter of fact, for Jesus to make that statement as one of the teachers of the law was quite profound, was quite ominous, because it could be nothing less for a Jew to have the temple completely destroyed, and then to say not one stone left on top of another than the end of the world, that this is the end of the world. And so with that in mind, as they are leaving the temple, they are on their way to the Mount of Olives walking, the disciples begin to think about what Jesus just said. Verse 3, later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all of this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Let's bow our heads right now and receive what God is wanting to speak to us individually corporately, but also individually today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. They can take what I say and actually make it applicable to every single person, to where they live, to what they're going through, no matter their age. If their age is in their 60s or their age is 16, God, you can speak to every person in this room, people who are watching Wherever they are, I pray your, your Holy Spirit will do his thing in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big amen. amen. You may be seated. I got a question for you. I'd like to have a little crowd participation. How many of you uh, enjoy um, a little bit of fright? Just a little bit of fright. Now, let me, let me, let me throw out the context of that. Let, let's go back to maybe sitting around a campfire with some friends and telling little scary stories. Or for some of you, it may be like, I like kind of haunted houses. I like Halloween going to haunted house or whatever it may be. It's kind of like, raise your hand, show of hands right now, all, all locations you like. It's kind of a little fun. It's a little bit of stimulating of excitement to you. You really, okay, we've got a few hands raised. Some people don't, but I really believe that all of us have a little bit of that that we enjoy. There's something that it creates a little bit of excitement, the scary things. I was, this past week, uh, noticing as I was in my office, this incredible noise that was coming out of the uh, elementary area of our kids' ministry. And so what we do during the week is we have child care that's provided for our staff that are here uh, during the week. And this, they were screaming. I, I walked out and I saw them just running around. It was their playtime that they were just allowed to go crazy for a little bit. And they were going crazy, probably about 12 kids in the room and screaming at the top of their lungs. They're going, it's, it's utter chaos in the room. And so I just decided to add my chaos to it. 
So I opened the door, I stepped into the room, and I just, with them just going crazy, now they don't even notice I'm in the room, because it's a large room, I just scream at the top of my lungs. And when I did, they all stopped. And you could sense a little bit of fear initially. And then when they turned and saw that it was me, I, I am not lying about this. Every single one of them, all 12 of them, attacked me at one time. And the next thing I knew, I had 12 kids on my ankles, on my legs, on my waist, hanging all over me and just screaming on top of me. COVID, you can't have us. I'm just saying. There's something about when we think about the end times that for many people creates a lot of scare, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of fear. But I'm here to tell you as children of God, while there's still a sense of uncertainty for all of us because we haven't walked through that, but there's still a sense of excitement that we can have, that what is scary can actually be fun. That's the title of my message. What is actually scary can really be fun for the follower of Jesus Christ. And so what's coming next? I mean, we've had a pandemic that has reached its hands across the world. This has never happened in world history. I realize that there's been plagues that have decimated large regions of the world. There has been issues that have impacted uh, you go back to the 1918 uh, Spanish flu that hit America and just literally killed hundreds of thousands of people. And then it was also doing the same thing in Europe. But even the Spanish flu did not reach into the far corners of the world like today. The reason why is because of transportation. The ability to be able to get around the world has literally allowed such a pandemic to create what it's created today. What's next? Economics have shut down around the world. Now they're reopening, yes, but we're still feeling the impact. We're still feeling what we went through and what we are still going through. I mean, sports. Who would ever dream that sports would be completely shut down for months and months and months? And now we've back, opened back up for the NBA to play in a bubble at Walt Disney. Who would have dreamt that? Who would have dreamt some of the things that we're dealing with right now in school decisions and education and all of those things? What comes next? I hear some prophetic voices that are screaming out. I'm going to deal with some of that next week. But what really comes next? What we really don't know. What is going to be unveiled? But let me give you what I know from according to scriptures is going to happen. What comes next? Write this down in your notes. This is the first thing I want you to get down. The first thing is that Jesus will come back again. I want you to write that down. Jesus is coming. He is coming. Now, when I think about that, I, I think about people's promises that they have made to me in the past. And there are some people that when they make a promise to me and they say, I will do that, you take it with a grain of salt. Anybody like that? They'll say, I'll be there at that time. You're like, you know their patterns, their histories. They're like, okay, if they are, they are, and I'm not going to count on it. But there's other people, when they make a promise to you, you can go to the bank on it, right? And you know that if they make a promise to you, that they are going to follow through on their promise with everything they can. And if it does not happen, it's going to be something out of their control that has kept them from doing that. Hear me. That's with men and women that I know in my life. that They would do whatever they can. But some things can even be out of their control. And when I've known somebody didn't show up, I knew something happened that they could not control. Is why they are not here or didn't follow through. But when Jesus makes a promise, and he did, in John chapter number 14 and verse number 3, look what it says here. Jesus says, I will come back again. I will come back again. That's his promise that he has made to us. Now, get this. He was fully human, but he was fully God. And while you and I may make a promise to somebody and there literally may be something out of our control to follow through on the promise and though we are intent and want to is that we want to do that but we can't, Jesus, there is nothing out of his control. There's nothing beyond his power. 
There's nothing out of his scope of being able to fulfill. And when Jesus says that he is going to do something, you can mark it down. You can go to the bank on it. It is going to happen. And Jesus said, I will come back again. Second thing is this. Jesus is coming will be soon. Jesus is coming soon. If you notice, people's last statements are always the things that they want you to remember the most. Whether it's going on a trip that's going to be gone for a long period of time, they want to leave you instructions. So we had this weekend the opportunity and the privilege to be able to have my grandson Gideon, who is actually in the room right now, sitting on the front row with his Gigi. And it has been absolutely wonderful because it's the first time we've actually had him without the parents so we can actually do what we want to do. <laughs> but mama left detailed instructions for what to do and when to do on everything. It was amazing, like just like pages of it. Because that's what you do when you're going to leave the first time in several months since you've had this child, you're going to leave this child. You're going to leave detailed information. You, Jesus wanted us to know that he is coming and he is coming soon. The very last thing he said in his book that he gave us, the Bible, in Revelation, chapter number 22, look what it says in verse number 20. It says these words, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming. And then he adds the word said with me soon. And the response that John, who is writing this down on the Isle of Patmos, 90 years of age, responds back, amen, which means so be it, come Lord Jesus. He testified. Who is he? Jesus. The last thing he said when he is about to depart this earth is, I will come back and I'm going to come soon. The last thing he gives to John while he's on the Isle of Patmos, the last book of the Bible is, I will come Soon. Soon. What does that word soon mean? Well, we can take it in a couple of ways. Let me give you the first way. It's literally time frame. Boom. But well, it's been 2,000 years. He said he was coming soon. He hasn't come back. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean to us, to me and you? Does it mean he forgot? Well, first off is that our time frames are whole different than what God's time frames are. He even says that one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day in his life. But right, here's a God who literally lives in the past, he lives in the present, and he lives in the future at one time because that's who he is. None of us do that. We're lucky to be living in the moment. And he lives in all those time frames. What is time to him? I think we can understand this in regards to a child. We put them in the car, they're two or three years of age, and you're gonna go on a few hour trip. And what happens? You lock them in that car seat in which I feel for kids today. I grew up and I understand the validity of it. I understand the necessity of it. I understand really it saves lives. But I grew up where I could roam the car as we were traveling down the road. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I slept in the back window of a vehicle. We would ride in the back of a truck for a two hour trip down the interstate to go from one city to another city. Now, I don't say we should go back to that, but just stop and think about these kids today. These poor kids are locked in. I mean, we lock them in. It's worse than being confined into a jail. And we say, now you be happy for the next three hours on this trip. And so what do they do? They get into 10 minutes along the journey. They ask the question, are we there yet? You can say it. Right, we've got about a two-hour trip, three-hour trip, da-da-da. What's going to happen 10 minutes later? They're going to ask the question. Are we there yet? And then what happens? It's just repetitive cycle, and you hope and pray to God that they fall asleep. Tom frames, his ways are higher than our ways. His ability to be able to look at time is different than our time frame. But let me also say this. When it comes to that word soon, it really means something else. The Greek word, as you go back to, does not mean in time frames as we think them. It means soon, suddenly. Quickly. Most every time it says that Jesus is coming soon, it means he will come quickly. It will come. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter number 24, if you look on down there, it says that as lightning flashes from the east and to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so what it's saying, not that scripture yet, later on, it's saying that you just need to be ready. That it's going to happen suddenly, suddenly, 
suddenly. Which brings me to the next thought. No one knows when Jesus will come. No one knows. No one. Look at the person next to you and say, you don't know. You, you don't know. There's a lot of people that's been trying to figure this out. As a matter of fact, we've justified by saying, oh, we know these seasons is going to come. And this season and this time frame, I'm, I'm just, just, just hear me on this. We don't have the prophetic, we don't have the eschatological knowledge that we sometimes think we do, in my personal opinion. We, we can dive into the blood moons. We can dive into, you know, the Jewish festivals. We can dive in. And I actually enjoy hearing and, and studying that stuff. But I am more and more convinced as time goes on that we cannot figure it out. And God never meant for us to try to figure it out. God wanted us to be ready. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-millennial, all millennial, post millennial, all of these issues and all of this stuff that may have its place in the study of the end times, what, that's what eschatology means. But bottom line is, we get so wrapped up in that that we miss the central thing of what it's all about, and that's being ready for his soon coming. And he is coming really soon. Notice what it says in Matthew 24 and verse 36. It says, No one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Jesus said, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. So why are we trying to figure this thing out? Why are we racking our brains trying to... Let's be focused. He is coming. He is coming soon. As lightning flashes, no one knows. What are we supposed to be? Be ready. Just be ready. Look at verse number 42. It says, so you two must keep watch, for you don't know when the day your Lord is coming. So he brings it out and says, you, you just be watching and be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the last thought. is Jesus is coming for his bride. Jesus is coming for his bride. His bride, what is his bride? What does that mean? Okay, let me just throw out this way. This past week um, was my mom's birthday. And so I want to send her a card and I typically give what every mama wants on her birthday is a Chick-fil-A gift card, right? That's what, so I, I'm going to have the card. It's all written up. All I have to do is get the card, and I'm going to go and drop it in the mail. And so I drive down 33rd and Edmond. And granted, this is the first time I've driven down 33rd and Edmond to go to that Chick-fil-A in like two months. I had not been down 33rd in over two months. I just don't go that way. And so I'm going to go by there, get me a gift card, put it in. And I'm just driving along, you know, thinking about everything else, the business, what I get accomplished in the day, and all the stuff is going through my brain. And I get up to where I'm going to be turning and all of a sudden, I look, and here's my first thought. There's nothing there. There's bulldozers and excavation, but there's no building. My first thought was, I'm lost. I must have turned down old age is sitting in fast. And I, I looked, and then I looked to the other side of the road, and I saw buildings that were familiar, and I'm thinking, no, I'm not lost. Here's my second thought. The rapture took place. The rapture took place. But here's what just confused me, because I knew that Chick-fil-A was a Christian business, and probably a lot of them would probably go to heaven, but I didn't think Jesus would take the whole building. <laughs> I said this to somebody the other day, and actually I had somebody in the church who actually works there make this statement to me. He said, Pastor, you just should have looked to the other side of the road and saw if God took Hobby Lobby, and you'd realize that there was no rapture. Because Hobby Lobby was still there. His coming is soon. Look at Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 41. It says, 40, two men will be working in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be working in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Verse 41. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken 
the other left. Let that sink in for just a moment. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. That is like, as lightning shines. How many have ever been ready for lightning? No, you're ready for the thunder after the lightning, but you're not ready for the lightning. No one knows when, so you just got to be ready. And he's coming for his bride. So who is his bride? Who, who is his bride? I, I, want, I want to be very careful of this. Sometimes in the church, and even I have fallen into this, is that I, we will pray a sinner's prayer at the end of an experience. And we'll say, repeat after me. But I don't want to give you, if you're watching this, if you are wherever you're at or you're in this room right now, I don't want to give you a false sense of security just because you repeated a prayer after me. You are saved and born again and on your way to heaven. Because unless the Holy Spirit tugs at your heart, and unless you have repented of your heart, it's not about the right words. It's about the repentance of the heart and dying to yourself and allowing the Spirit of God to rejuvenate and recreate. And the old is gone and the new has come alive that you can be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's not repeating the prayer. Though that is a part of the conscious awareness of the God's conviction and power that you want to repent of your sins, but it is a transformation of the heart and life. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything you have. What man wants to be married to a bride who really does not love them? What woman wants to be married to a husband that really doesn't love them? My God knows who loves him with all, with everything. You know, when I talk about this, it can be a little bit scary. It can be a little angst. I was thinking about this in regards to Gideon and his daddy because his daddy comes home and one of the things that his daddy does is loves to just growl at his son. And my wife thinks it's kind of odd that Gideon thinks this is hilarious. And I said, Shannon, this is a guy thing. You just got to trust me. I mean, he is definitely a boy. He wants to fight and wrestle. And so my, my son will come in to Gideon, my grandson, and just beat his chest. And Gideon just starts laughing. Matter of fact, you don't see that. Here you go, watch this. This is what happens. <laughs> 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 There's a part of what's happened in the world you feel like that this world is just beating its chest. <laughs> And the heavens are going, Rah. and for many people, it rightly should be scary. But the follower of Jesus Christ, it's an invitation in the final moments with God. It's something to look forward to. Is anybody with me? You read Matthew chapter 24 and the signs, the signs. I don't have time to go through all of that, but all of those things. Don't get caught up in all the signs. Be ready. We are in the end times. Jesus is coming back. His coming is going to be soon. No one knows when, and he's only coming for his bride. Be ready. So who is those that are going to be left behind? Let me just give you three real quick. First off, those who have a cavalier attitude. Now, I know that word cavalier can mean a knight in shining armor coming to the rescue, but also has other meanings. And the meaning that I want to focus in on is an arrogance. A sense of, I got this and I don't need any help. I can actually do it on my own. And that attitude is going to keep people from making it to heaven. Jesus says on verse number 37 on down, look what it says. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time that Noah entered his boat. So hold there for just a moment. I used to read this and I used to think it was, you know, he's not coming for those who are living in debauchery, drunkenness, 
divorcing and remarrying and all of this stuff and parties and lasciviousness. I, I used to think that that's what he was talking about. And as I really began to study and look into it, no, no, there's more to it than that because the King James says divorcing and giving in and doing more. But no, what it really means here, the ultimate context of what the writer wants you to understand is that they were just going about life, unaware of what was about to happen. You see, it's obvious that if they're living in drunkenness and all these other parties and orgies and yeah, 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 they're gonna be left behind. But what about these good people? Good people that just are caught up in the activities of everyday life and they're busy about going about, not aware of what is coming their way. Be ready. Look at verse number 39. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. It's not just the bad, it's the good. Jim Collins wrote a book years ago, Good to Great. And basically he said, good is the enemy of great. And I'm telling you, in the church world, good is the enemy of great. I'm a good, I'm good, I'm fine enough. No, no, it's not that. It's not the standard that I'm okay and I am good. It is, are you living surrendered, totally given to your Lord and Savior? Are you truly in love with him? Have you died to yourself and living for him? Jesus talked about seed that were planted on good ground. And the seed grew up and had everything it needed, but the thorns wrapped around it. And when he explained the thorns, he said the thorns were the busyness of life and the desire for things. And all that can be us, having a cavalier attitude. We're so busy with life that Jesus takes a back seat. We're so busy with job promotions and homes and everything else that everything else that really, really matters, the coming of Jesus takes a back seat, a cavalier attitude. Secondly, is a careless attitude. Who are those left behind? A careless attitude. Some months ago, I told you about Shannon and I waking up 3.50 in the morning to the police with a bright light shining into our house. I mean, I jumped up out of bed not knowing what was going on. I just hear banging and see floodlights going into our house. All I have on is my boxers. I go in to start to get, and I realize I don't have time for that. I've got to go confront whatever's going on, not knowing. And then as I am walking out the door, Shannon is yelling, it's the police, Rodney, it's the police. Because she's looking on one of the cameras on the front. I still don't know if they may think I'm a robber, I'm coming out. I, I don't know what's going to go on. I feel that fear inside of me. I feel that it's going on. Everything turned out good, but what had happened was Apparently, there were two in the neighborhood that had gotten two men this time of the morning who had gotten into some trouble, and they should not have been where they were around some houses. And so the police got them and just kind of taken them, and they went around to check the houses, and we had left our garage door open. I was careless and left it open. Everything turned out fine but what could have been. Hear me. Are you living careless with your life? How are you living your life? Look what it says in Matthew 24, and verse 43. Understand this, Jesus says, if a homeowner knew exactly when the burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into Don't be careless. Don't be careless in your relationships, in your friendships. Don't be careless. It's not worth the gamble. And finally is this callous attitude. People with a calloused attitude. And what that word callous means is what you think it means, a hardened, hardened heart. Notice what Jesus says, a faithful, a sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibilities of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds his servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. Hold there for just a moment. I'm going to dive into that in the next couple of weeks because I think sometimes we think of heaven as just being this place where we're floating around and Clouds like angels and, no, 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 no. I want you to understand, 
the new heaven, heavens and the new earth. God's going to take this earth. It's going to be restored, destroyed by fire, but it's going to be re-put back like it was in the garden with perfection. Is, is anyone tracking with me? And you're not going to be floating around. You're going to be given responsibilities based upon the rewards of here, and we're going to carry on advancing God's cause and kingdom for all eternity. It ain't going to be a boring place. It ain't going to be just floating around angels with nothing. No, you're going to have your bodies. You're going to have your full senses. You're going to have everything about you. And everything that you have ever enjoyed here on earth is going to be multiplied many times over without sin so that we can bring glory to God. That should make you shout. That should get you excited. I got one with me today here. Verse 47, I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all that he owns. And that's the goal. Well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. A couple of weeks ago, I was doing some stuff for Shannon and putting a bunch of screws in. And I remember it was really hard. I didn't have a, do not have an electric screwdriver, which I probably need to get one now. And I was having to, I was my, the handle of the screwdriver was right in the palm of my hand. I was pushing down and turning, pushing down and turning, pushing down and turning. And after a while, I got a good blister and it began to hurt. And the pain set in. A few days later, I went back to do some of the same stuff and the callus had set it in and I was able to do what I was doing before without the pain that I had days before. And that worked good for my hand in that scenario, but it doesn't work good for your spirituality. You see, the calloused, hardened heart that I'm talking about, it's when we hear the tug of the Holy Spirit and his conviction on our life and those areas that need to be surrendered to him, and we just slough it off. We just push it aside. And each time you disobey the tug of the Spirit upon your heart, you're hardening your heart. You're hardening your heart. You're hardening your heart. Callous gets over, and there comes a point that you don't even realize what you're doing. It's normative. It's the way you live. Verse 48. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying and giving him drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected. You see that again? Unannounced and unexpected. He is coming. He is coming soon. Moment. Boom. And no one knows when. And he will cut the servant into pieces and sign him to the place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, he gives an image here of trust to find out who is really his bride. And he finds out by their actions. And what is the solution to this? The solution is be ready. You've heard me say it several times in this message. Notice what Jesus says. You must also be ready all the time. Not when you figured out the signs, not the season he's going to come again, but all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. You surrender everything to him. You give all to him. This is grandson Gideon Day. One of the things that I enjoy when I come, sometimes Shannon will come on a Friday and we'll get there before my son gets off of work. We were playing in the living room and as we're playing in the living room, my son's truck is quite loud. And as he will pull up, you can hear his truck coming down the road and then pulling into the driveway. The moment my son, uh, my grandson Gideon hears the sound of the truck, his ears perk up, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. And sometimes when Gavin will park, he may go get the trash cans and begin to move. You can hear the trash cans coming up. He's da-da, da-da-da. He's kind of looking around, da-da. 
Sometimes Gavin will go in the garage. He may need to do something there. You just never know how long it's going to take. But I'm sure for my little grandson, it could not be fast enough. But at some point, that doorknob begins to turn. And as soon as he hears that doorknob turn, he looks right to that door. And he's like, dad, dad. He gets up and he starts running to that door. With his arms wide open to receive his dad. Hear me. The signs of the time are all around us. All that should mean is we should be saying, Dad, Dad is almost here. Jesus is coming back. And I'm so anticipating the sound of that trumpet. I'm so anticipating his coming back. And if that does not stoke something inside of you, then I want to pray with you and I want to invite you to be a follower of Jesus Christ and make him Lord of your life. And if you are a Christian and sometimes that creates a little bit of, oh, I don't know. No, 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 hear hear me, hear me. It is scary because there's uncertainty we don't know about. We've not walked that way, but it's also fun. It's also fun. It's also something that we can trust our heavenly father just like my grandson trusts his dad. And he's beating his chest and yelling, but oh, we can laugh and know that my God is going to take care of his children. That's good to know. No pandemic cripples us and scares us. We're children of God. Father, I pray right now, your Holy Spirit, would you close your eyes, bow your heads, invite the Holy Spirit right now to speak into your life. If you need Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit on your heart, call out to him. Choose to become a follower of Jesus right now. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Father, I pray now that your Holy Spirit will just begin to flood into homes, into cars, onto porches, into Guthrie Upper Elementary, into North Church, Oklahoma City, into Freedom House, any homes or watch parties where people are watching this right now. And we'll live surrendered, surrendered completely to you. In Jesus' name, I pray it done. And everybody said, amen.